but hopefully there's somebody honest in there. And my experience has been that we do run into honest people. Okay, so... All right, here's an author, Tollier. He says that minutes, minutes are called because the writing in which they were originally was small, that the word is derived from the Latin minuta scriptura in opposition to copies which were delivered to the parties and which were always written in a larger hand. So, minutes... Okay, so the copies which were delivered to the parties were in large hand. The copies that were not delivered to the parties, the, the court... The, the court clerk's minutes. Well, that was a small hand. And what's a minute book? It's a book kept by the clerk or prosonotary of a court in which minutes of its proceedings are entered. So a minute order, I presume, is going into the minute book. Okay? All right, let's see. Court of record, let's see. All right, let's. Um, <clears throat> let's go to an actual example where all this stuff was applied. <coughs> okay. This is a case that was in San Bernardino County. The names have been changed to protect the guilty. But basically, uh, let's take a break, okay? I'm kind of feeling it myself here. I think we can fix that. As soon as I get... You caught me dressing. <laughs> okay. Well, <clears throat> let's get into an, an actual example here. <clears throat> okay? So... Here's the example. Basically, what I want to do is kind of run through this case. And what we have here is the... Um, um, we have the sovereign suing somebody because somebody went through a stop sign or actually stopped at the stop sign but then went into the intersection and the uh, sovereign plaintiff was riding his bicycle and that when he got struck it, re, it resulted in several injuries I guess he's having a good time out there he had several injuries which amounted somewhere around fifty to seventy five thousand dollars in surgery so uh, <clears throat> the California vehicle code says that whenever a licensed minor gets involved in an accident, uh, the liability is limited to $15,000. It also says that the liability of the parent is limited to $15,000. And it also says that the aggregate total of the driver's, the minor's liability and the parent's liability is $15,000. And they had $15,000 in insurance. So that meant that the victim paid the majority part of the loss. Okay? Well, um, nobody wanted to yield, so they got sued. And basically, what the uh, plaintiff said was that, A, they're responsible anyway for the whole thing because he sued under common law. And the common law says that there's always a remedy. Okay, there has to be a remedy for every wrong even if you have to make up a remedy. So he sued under common law and he also sued the state of California because the state of California, you see, the, the state, normally a lawmaking body does not have liability for the laws it makes. And the reason is, is because it's just setting up some suggestions. Okay, remember, this is a republic and the laws are not mandatory. They're advisory. So these are the suggestions that they have. So normally they're not liable. However, when, they, when a state jumps into the fray and participates in the commerce, then they lose 
whatever sovereign immunity they claim even under statutes and they become just as liable as any party. So what the plaintiff said in this case was, well, the state of California, first of all, licenses the driver. It doesn't just pass a law, it licenses. It examines the driver. It does quality control by having quality control agents out on the street called traffic cops. Okay? It participates in, in uh, uh, programs. It, it, you know, it's, it's an active member of this, this whole environment. And as a result, they have a liability. Well, of course, they denied that. They did a demur. And in their demur, a demur, by the way, anytime you make a demur, anytime anybody that makes a demur, whoever makes a demur automatically agrees to all the facts. All demurs are based on law. Well, not really all, but from your standpoint, they basically are. Yes. Oh. oh, so uh, a demur, don't ever do a demur unless you're ready to agree to the facts. You see, whenever somebody sues, you make all kinds of claims about facts, you make all kinds of claims about law, and you say, because of these, you're owed money. Well, when you answer a lawsuit, normally you say, no, the facts are wrong, and no, the law is wrong, these are the real facts, and this is the real law. That's how it normally goes. But in a demur, basically a demur is half a loss, half an answer. Because the first half, where you challenge the facts, is not there. You agree to all the facts. Okay? And you, so the only thing left to argue in a demur is the law. Okay? So you argue the law. Now, an interesting thing about that is that if you argue the law, you can now purely at the discretion of the court. If you put in a demur, arguing only the law, once that demur is settled, the court, at its own discretion, can jump straight to the judgment, no trial. <clears throat> okay? We have a court case going now, I've told you before, about the four judges. It's also against uh, a half dozen uh, DAs, five public defenders, and a few other misbehaving people and they every one of them demurred every one of them wait till that last demur gets answered <laughs> we're going to have fun with that one <laughs> because they all agreed to the facts we said that the we said a motion was made for juris you know challenging jurisdiction and not a motion but we challenged jurisdiction and they admit that. We said they never did anything to respond to it. Their demur says that's true. As a matter of fact, the demur that was offered by the judges, they specifically quoted the case that says that they agreed to all the facts if they demur. Okay. Do you see the word stupid? <laughs> Not at hand, but yeah, it's it's Aurora's case. Anyway, it's a it's a case that's in in process right now. Anyway, this is a case that, by the way, it's still going. We're getting ready to write the final judgment. In fact, I would have written it a month ago, excepting for the fact I got really entangled in another case. So, but anyway, here's what happened: the uh, the the uh, plaintiff filed a a um, uh, an action for trespass. Now, let me explain the difference between an action and a complaint. They're really about the same. But an action uh, basically is the court proceeding. A complaint is a court proceeding with a magistrate. That's basically the difference. Okay? All right, so, all right, so there was an action for trespass. It was a bad... Uh, badly composed action so later on we filed a first amended action to fix the problems that we found in the action so it's, ger it's just there for the record it really isn't sh should not be used as an example but then the opposition did a demur okay and in his demur 
he says the usual things that they all say in Demers, which is that uh, there was a failure to state a claim upon which, here it is, the complaint fails to state facts sufficient to constitute a cause of action against defendant. Okay? And also the complaint is uncertain, ambiguous, and unintelligible. Now this is just boilerplate stuff. And what that does, that sets it up so that the judge, if he is in fact acting as a tribunal, will use his discretion to say that he doesn't understand it either. It doesn't matter how clearly you wrote it, he won't understand it. Okay? In fact, this was noticed by um, an English judge. Again, I can't quote him exactly, but what he said was that everybody is presumed to know the law except whose majest- except his majesty's judges who have the court of appeals to set him straight. <laughs> but anyhow, this is boilerplate, okay? So, this is to all parties, please take notice. Okay, and that's his notice. So, that's not the demur. Then he makes his points and authorities, okay, where he says, he says is a point, and then he cites his authorities. And again, in the prior seminar we had, uh, we went into what points and authorities were, so I'm not going to go into it here. But basically, the points and authorities, and he makes all his points, and he has his conclusion. Now, what's interesting about this, and I didn't notice this before, otherwise I would have made some hay with it, but... He never gave us a demur. He gave us the notice. Please take notice. He did say that... uh, Here it is. Let's see. The court will hear the demur, right? And then he he makes some points here, but he didn't label it as a demur. He put it under the heading of notice. Now, it's true, headings don't control, but on the other hand, you are supposed to have a notice you are supposed to have a specific demur and you're supposed to have a specific points and authorities. Well, he left out the, de- the actual demur, although the actual demur would probably look exactly like paragraphs one and two. But there's an interesting point about, about this, paragraphs one and two. You notice that it's, this is a general demur. He just makes a blanket statement. Right? I don't understand it. Right? Well... If you look in uh, Bouvier's Law Dictionary under demurs, you'll find a case there that says that whenever they make an objection that's general in nature like that, where it, it uh, you know, they don't get into specifics about just exactly what it is, that, what part they don't understand, then the court must deny the demur. No option. It must deny it. <laughs> So they're leaning on the, 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 the idea that, hey, we're a member of the club, we're the attorneys, the judge is on our side, it'll get denied. And it normally is, because judges don't like amateurs in their courtrooms. Okay? They like trained attorneys. So that's what... Well, anyway, what happened was in this demur, um, it did get denied. Okay, rather than granted. For some reason, the judge did deny it. Well, we knew we had a defective lawsuit. And what we were aching for was an excuse to revise the, la- the lawsuit. Okay? And this judge gave it to us when he denied the demur to the opposition. If he had granted the demur, then the demur would have been the issue, not the lawsuit. But since he denied it, we basically came back with our our own thing. But let's go to the uh, let's go to the, the actual transcript. You know, for some reason it's not going there. All right. I think my computer went to sleep on me in some aspect. Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so here's here's the uh, transcript. So this is what went on in court. 
So he says, uh, he calls the case, and then uh, the, the plaintiff and defendant attorney uh, respond, and he says, uh, they get into discussion, he had a tape recorder, the, the plaintiff had a tape recorder, and the, and the California rules of court say that you can't have a tape recorder unless you get the permission first of the court. They don't like having live evidence, okay? So, anyway, they got in some discussion, and the judge says, you are to turn off that recording device or leave the courtroom, one of the two. That's the order of the court. So, he, the plaintiff says, well, excuse me, Your Honor, this is, and the judge says, that's a standing rule of court. So he says he has a problem hearing. And the judge says, well, we have a court reporter. I do not allow tape recordings in this court. That's a California rule of court, period. See, it's not a California rule of court, period. It's a California rule of court, but you can get permission. But the judge doesn't like that. Okay. I don't... Well, anyway. So, the judge uh, uh, he says, uh, there are ways to take care of that often. And the plaintiff says, well, how would that be? And the judge says, I, well, I'm going to explain some procedures to you. You may leave the recording on as I explain the proceedings to you. Then you're going to turn it off, okay? All right, very well, he says. Are you an attorney at law, sir? No. You filed a lawsuit in this court. I have to hold you to the same rules. Are you hearing me? Yes. Tell me if you don't hear me, okay? Yeah. If you would speak up a little bit, please. All right. I have to hold you to the same rules that I do everybody else. That practices law in my courtroom. My courtroom, right? Yeah. This is the people's court, not his court. But nevertheless, he says my courtroom. Those are the rules of the court. You notice how authoritative he speaks. Okay? He says, uh, so he says, which rules? And judge says, in other words, I have to hold you to the same standards as anyone else who comes into my courtroom, including the attorneys who have knowledge of all the rules of court. Which rules of court are you talking about? California Rules of Court, period. It's called California Rules of Court. Okay. And uh, uh, he says, well, then, all due respect, sir, then I must object for the record. Okay. And, ju and uh, the plaintiff says, I have, this, this is a court of record, and we have chosen these rules that govern the procedures of this court. Judge says, that's right. I have California Rules of Court. I don't know what you're talking about now. He says, well, do you have my action? Yes, in front of you? Uh-huh. Well, the second paragraph. The judge says, I'm trying to explain to you, sir, that you will comply with the California Rules of Court and you will be held to the same standards as any attorney who practices in this court because those are the rules of court. And so one of the rules of court is we do not allow electronic devices. And so he goes, okay? So you've got that character of and, and what this judge is without us going through the whole thing. All right? So let's go... That, that was pretty much that. Now, we go down here to... Okay. What he did is... Uh, the plaintiff, basically, when a judge misbehaves in, the, in there, when he issues an order... Now, you understand that you cannot attack the discretion of the judge. Once you give him discretion and he uses it, you cannot be unhappy that he used it. After all, you said you can use your judgment. Okay? So discretion on the part of a judge, unless it really goes overboard, and, and I don't know how far it has to go over because I've, I've read some pretty horrible things. But the judge, if he has discretion, he can exercise it. And you have no complaints when he exercises it, no matter how he does even if he does it maliciously, believe it or not. But if he has no jurisdiction, it doesn't matter how little the discretion is, it doesn't matter how right his decision is, it's not allowed. Okay? So, the way you do, when the judge makes a decision, he is now outside the court. Even if he's sitting on the bench, he's outside. When he takes that decision and gives it to the clerk and the clerk files it, that is an error in procedure. Why? Because the clerk is accepting a ruling from an unauthorized source. It's not from a source that used bad discretion. It's from a source that never had the authority in the first place. Okay? So the discretion that, that is not allowed... And if he files an order 
which he's not allowed to do in a court of record because the tribunal is supposed to be independent of the magistrate, right? That magistrate files that order. The clerk made a mistake and, and that is the error. It's not an error in judgment. It's an error in procedure. Okay? Now, we have a way of correcting that error in procedure. It's different from how you correct an error in judgment. An error in procedure is real simple. All the sovereign has to do is issue what's called a writ of error quorum nobis. Okay? Writ of error means we're correcting the error in procedure. Quorum nobis means the court is correcting its own error. That's different from a quorum vobis which is a higher court correcting the procedural errors of a lower court. Okay? Okay, so we do a writ of error. So you see here, we have a writ of error. But before we get to the writ of error, we had to do a few things. So the first thing we did was a judicial notice. Now, a judicial notice means that the court takes notice of something. Okay? There are certain things that a court can automatically take notice of. For example, it can take notice of the English language. It can take notice of the laws. It can take notice of the court records. These are all things that do not have to be proven in ed evidence. Okay? They, they stand on their own without proof. They are there. So, thank you. So the... the, the that's a judicial notice. Now, when a court takes judicial notice of something, these are things that the court will consider when it arrives at some decision. Okay? It just considers it. That's different from a judicial cognizance. A judicial cognizance is one notch higher. In a judicial cognizance, whatever it takes cognizance of that is mandatory on the judge and it has to be compatible with the decision. Whereas if the, if the court takes judicial notice of something, it's advisory. It's kind of like, okay, we'll see if that matches up with this. We, we, ex we notice it, we accept it as valid, but it may or may not apply to this case. In judicial cognizance, it must apply to the case. The case must be consistent with the judicial cognizance. In this case, we picked a judicial notice. So here's what the judicial notice said. <clears throat> the court, on its own motion, takes judicial notice of the following. All items mentioned in the California Evidence Code, sections 451 and 452, among which is included the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. So, any rules of civil procedure in the Federal Rules we can take judicial notice of, okay? Now, this is the sovereign who's issuing this judicial notice. When you are the plaintiff or you are the, uh, uh, the defendant, either way, you can apply to the court to take judicial notice of whatever it is you want the court to notice. But in this case, the sovereign himself, in his sovereign capacity instead of plaintiff capacity, the sovereign as part of the court issued this judicial notice. Okay. And so he's saying, we notice the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. Now, the reason he did this was because in his original action, he did specify the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure would be the rules of the court, not the California Rules of Court. Okay? You can set up any set of rules you want. You can make up your own rules if you want. But what I generally do is I adopt the, the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. main reason is because they're simpler. Okay? And I know them better. And they're universal all throughout the United States. So, okay. The records of this court in general and the reporter's transcript of the proceedings on February 18th and so forth. So that, that's, it is the public policy of the state that the public agencies exist to aid in the conduct of the people's business. The people of this state do not yield their sovereignty to the agencies which serve them. California Government Code. We take judicial notice of that. And we take judicial notice of uh, the same thing in the 54950. And we take judicial notice of the case that said that the, at the revolution the sovereignty devolved, devolved on the people and they are truly the sovereign of the state and so forth. We took judicial notice of the meaning of sovereignty. We took the, the um, judicial notice of the, the rights which formerly belonged to the king by his prerogative. 
See how we went through? We went through all these things that we discussed before. Take judicial notice of all those cases. Okay? Uh, the state cannot diminish rights of the people. The assertion of federal rights when, when plainly and reasonably made is not to be defeated under the name of local practice. What was the local practice? Oh, we don't have tape recorders. Okay? No. What, what, what's the right of the sovereign? What are his rights? Whatever he says they are. Okay? So that automatically made, since it was his court, that automatically made tape recording just fine. Okay? So, but we're saying here, you can't defeat that right just because you have a local practice rule. Okay? There can be no sanction or penalty imposed upon one because of the exercise of constitutional rights. And is this a constitutional right to be a, a sovereign? Mm -hmm. Yes. Why? Because of the preamble. The preamble defines sovereign. Okay? <coughs> All right. Republican government. So, he's got a choice. He can exercise uh, his powers of sovereignty directly or through representatives. We're choosing to be direct in our court action. Okay, this is the sovereign court. And the state of California is in several parts of the United States and so forth. So we go through a whole bunch of this stuff, define a court of record. A court of record is a judicial tribunal having attributes and exercising functions independently of the person of the magistrate designated generally to hold it. Why did we put that in? Because the magistrate issued a direct order denying the opposition his demur. He wasn't authorized to issue any orders. That's reserved to the tribunal. Who's the tribunal? The plaintiff. The sovereign plaintiff, right? Exactly. So, now, and we reach back here. What is the common law? I skipped over that earlier, but here it is. You see, the common law, bureaucrats love things in writing. Now, it's, if you've studied your common law, you'll know that common law is not written. Okay? And when they say it's not written, that doesn't mean there's nothing written. What it really means is that there is no single authoritative source you can go to for the common law. Whereas with statutory law, you have a legislature to look at. The legislature created the common law. Whereas in statutory law, the, uh, I mean, in common law, the common law is custom and usage since time immemorial. Okay? Well, where do you find that in writing? You know, who was it that originated the first common law? Well, there is no identifiable source. It's lost in history. Well, uh, nevertheless, bureaucrats love things in writing. So, how do you deal with these people? Well, what happened was that they came up with this Magna Carta. <clears throat> And after Magna Carta, when the king died, uh, the new king came in, King Edward. And the nobility that had been responsible for, for forcing the king to sign the Magna Carta immediately went to King Edward and got him to sign the Confirmatio Cartarum, which is the confirming charter, which is the document which reaffirms the validity of the Magna Carta under the new king. Okay? And so, in there, uh, he gave a new order relating to Magna Carta. And basically, what he said was right here. Our just, right here, this whole thing. Our justices, sheriffs, mayors, and other ministers, which under us have the laws of our land to guide, shall allow the said charters pleaded before them in judgment in all their points, that is to wit, the great charter as the common law. Okay? In other words, translating that into modern English, what he's saying is, is that if the defendant wants it, he can demand that the Magna Carta be the common law and it must be obeyed by the public servants or the king's servants. Okay? Now, we get the common law from England as it was as of 1789. Okay? And the Magna Carta was still good back in 1789. It, there were changes made, but they shifted things around rather than actually changing things. And so the Magna Carta is still good law, good common law. And when you have a bureaucrat who doesn't understand something in common law, 
you can bring in the Magna Carta and say this is common law because this is was what it was in 1789. Okay? So, we bring this out here. We let the judge know 